Okay. All right. Good. So for those of you out there on social media, we took a pause because we had a printing error, uh, and and I was the error. I was the problem. So, so we're we're on page two. But let me go back to page one. Uh, we're talking about you know uh, who are the two witnesses, and and a lot of people speculate that those are Elijah and Enoch, but the most biblical scholars believe or think that this, they're talking about Moses and Elijah because those were the two most influential Old Testament characters during the Hebrew time. And so throughout history, we know from reading the Old Testament and, and even the New Testament, God has been faithful about sending messengers to share the gospel, uh, to call sinners to repentance. That's the, the next blank there at the top of page two. So repentance. In 2 Kings 17, 13, he warned, the Lord warned Israel and Judah uh, through all those prophets saying, turn from your evil ways. And again, that's the same today. That, that, that's who we are. We're not prophets, but we are, uh, our command is to go and make disciples and to tell the story. And, and uh, as I was telling you, when we were in Alaska, walking up down that beach, the, 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 the one group of guys or people that rejected uh, us from telling the story of Christ was young white guys. Probably in forties in the forties. They just look at me, I don't want to hear that stuff. I'm here fishing, leave me alone. Okay. So he says, Turn from evil ways, observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your fathers to obey, and that I delivered to you through my servants, the prophets. And then in fourteen and fifteen of, of Second Kings he says, But they would not listen <laughs> and were stiff necked as their fathers who did not trust the Lord their God. They rejected the decrees and the covenant he had made with their fathers and the warnings he had given them. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. You know, we, we read there in in, uh, in 1 Corinthians about sect 2 about, you know, the man without the spirit is just, he's just foolish. He, he, and the gospel just is foolishness to him. Same thing. Uh, they they worship whatever they are, these worthless idols, and, and they become themselves worthless. It says, they imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do, and they did the things the Lord had forbidden them to do. So, those messengers delivered the same message that we're delivering or should be delivering today. But that's a pretty big, bleak picture for humanity. <clears throat> uh, but God always preserved a believing remnant. Next blank, a remnant. Uh, throughout the, the Bible, we see God reserving and preserving that remnant of his people. We know that, that salvation comes to, the, to this remnant of this faithful Israel and also believing Gentiles. And, and during the tribulation, we're going to see believing uh, Jews and Gentiles come to repentance in, in, in the tribulation because of faithful preaching that they'll hear. Jesus is all through that tribulation, all through those those judgments, he is still trying to get people to come to him. And so in, in the Old Testament, New Testament, those faithful preachers are called, they're calling people to repentance and to faith, and they, they offer that, that gift of salvation and forgiveness to all sinners, well, it's like we do right here at JFRC every Sunday. So we know those preachers. We, we know Jesus was, was a preacher. John the Baptist talked about him Sunday. Twelve disciples, Peter, Paul, Philip, Stephen, and there was a whole whole bunch more. Uh, those guys passed the gospel, the truth of the gospel, on to the next generation of godly preachers. And I give you a whole list of, of these guys, you know, throughout history. Uh, some prophets, some uh, secular historians, uh, but the, the 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 truth of the gospel has been passed down through these preachers throughout history. So back to the witnesses. These, these two supernatural witnesses, they, uh, the, the word tells us, the scholars tell us that they're going to be exceptional pastors. They're going to be exceptional and powerful preachers. You know, I heard, when I read that and talked about it and wrote that, I thought the guy that came to my mind was Billy Sunday. If you've never read about Billy Sunday and who he was and, you know, he was an alcoholic. When he came to Christ, man, he was full. He was a fire and brimstone guy. He's fun to read about. But, but there have been many, many like him. Uh, these guys will fearlessly, that's the blank, they will fearlessly proclaim the gospel uh, during that last three and a half years of the tribulation. And, and, and that, that's, that's, 
That's who we're supposed to be. We're, we're, you know, Joshua, it said, God said, Joshua, be strong and be courageous. And that means we, we you know, as a believer, we need, he want, God wants us to be in an uncomfortable work, place in our walk with Christ. He wants us to step out of our comfort zone and, and just, just let the Holy Spirit direct where, where he wants us to be. Like on our teams, you know, just, just get involved and, and the Lord will direct where he really wants you so that you can exercise the gift that he's given you. And so these guys are going to fearlessly proclaim the gospel during the three and a half, last three and a half years of the tribulation, which is going to be the earth's darkest time. Um, and so remember, Jesus calls this the great tribulation. And you can go back to those scriptures there and take a look at that and uh, see what he says about it. Uh, so in addition, to, in addition to preaching the gospel, these two guys are going to announce God's judgment on the world, the wicked, evil, evil world. So most of these scholars believe that the, the, the ministry of the, these two guys um, is going to stretch from the midpoint of the tribulation just before the blowing of the seventh trumpet. And so during that time, they're going to be participating in, fulfilling the words of Christ that the gospel is Matthew 24 part of the Olivet Discourse he says the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all nations and then the end will come this is that this is what we've talked about before I don't know how that's going to happen that's going to be some supernatural um, uh, uh, audio visual a uh, uh, I, I don't know uh, some I don't know how it's going to work but but the whole world is going to hear Hear the gospel according to this, according to the word. And that will also be used to bring uh, salvation to Israel. Uh, God's going to do that. So let's look at the scripture. In verses 1 and 2, here it talks about the two witnesses. And I wrote in my Bible, Moses and Elijah. It could be Elijah and Enoch, but I tend, after reading a lot of the biblical scholars and the writings, I tend to believe it could be Moses and Elijah. It says, then, verse 1 says, then... I was given a measuring reed like a rod with these words. Go and measure God's sanctuary and the altar and count those who worship there. But exclude the courtyard outside the sanctuary. Don't measure it because it is given to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. Well, there's been a lot written about, about what those two verses mean. Um, it, it's really... Uh, uh, well, I wrote it was sort of a fascinating incident, but John is a participant here because it tells him, he says, go and measure. Nobody knows what he's measuring. Um, I mean, why? Uh, he tells him to go and measure, and he gives him this rod or this reed. He said, go and measure this, but don't measure that. Um, so God is commissioning John to be a participant in this, in this, in these verses here. Uh, and and uh, he says, go and measure um, and it's probably, it could be for the Jews to build the temple during the tribulation. No, nobody knows for sure why. But we know that Daniel predicted that temple would be desecrated during the tribulation. Uh, you can go to Daniel 9.27. And so it's just a, setting the stage for these two guys to come. Uh, John, is, he's been a, an active participant in, in several of the visions that, that he's given. But here, he's given that reed like a measuring rod and told, go and measure the temple of God in the altar and count the worshipers there. Nobody had any comment about the worshipers. It's just nothing written that I could find. So why, why was he told to do that? And, and so what I write is, what I read is the reason is to show that man built the temple by man's standards. And that brings me back to what I said earlier about the today in Israel and those groups that allege that they have warehouses uh, in different parts of the city uh, housing pieces of the temple that they, they say they're ready to build the temple when it's time. So have they done that on their own like, like these, these people were thinking? Or, or were they directed by, by God the Father? I don't know. If they're doing it on their own, they're doing it, they're wasting their time. As far as, I mean, that, that's the way, we're, we can't do anything on our own. 
But that's what it appears to me. So, it's, and, and I write in the next, next statement, said the impatience of man in building the temple is the rejection of Christ. They have gotten ahead of God. And that's what we do a lot of times. We, we, man, we get impatient and we want to, we, we think we need to do something and we're tired of waiting on, 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 some, on God to answer our prayers. And we just say, well, I'll just, I'll just do it. I've been guilty of that. And so it says it's woefully inadequate because it's done by man because of his impatience. And, and, and so one writer said it was pitiful compared to what they will see when Christ builds his temple. So it tells me right there that they are doing this. These people today very likely could be building these pieces of the, the temple on their own because they're, they're tired. they don't want to wait on God. I may be wrong about that. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. But there, there could be some other reason why John was told to measure the temple, but there's no known reason. Um. Some of the writers said they they believe that John had to be encouraged about that because at that time Israel's future looked pretty dadgum bleak. If you remember back in in uh, AD 67, 66 to 70 when when the Romans attacked the Jewish people when they burned the city, burned it to the ground, uh, they slaughtered over one million Jews. They devastated Jerusalem, and they burned the temple. They didn't just burn the temple. They burnt the town to the ground. And, uh, I mean, it, it's, that's hard to ma imagine because you're talking about these stones. And I don't know what those stones weigh. They were several tons. You wonder how they even erected those buildings back in that time. But those stones were disintegrated. The fires were so hot. That's what I read. So, but in, in spite of that massive destruction, God did not reject that's Nicholas. He did not reject his people who he foreknew. So that, that could be that remnant. He, fore, he preserved them until that future day when the believing remnant of the nation will be saved. And there's some scriptures to go back and look, look at. So the altar is where those who worship there would have gathered. That they would have gathered there at the altar because they were never allowed inside the, the inner, inner part of the temple. Um, so these worshipers in John's vision, they represent that remnant of, of believing Jews that were alive during the tribulation and as they were worshiping God. John's measuring the temple symbolizes the marking of the believing Jewish remnant that God is going to spare from the judgment. And that seemed a little bit like a contradiction to me based on what, what I read to you before. But uh, this is, the, the scholars believe that it's just, a, it's symbolizing the marking of this remnant. You can read this verse there, Zechariah, make your own interpretation. So John's instructions on measuring the temple left out a significant part of the temple, and he was told to exclude the courtyard outside the sanctuary. So the Gentiles, the court of the Gentiles was located outside. So why, why did he do that? Well, number one, that outside area marked the boundary. It was the boundary where the Gentiles were forbidden to go. And so in New Testament times, the Romans gave the Jews the authority to execute. Now think about this. During that time, the Romans gave the Jews the authority to execute any Gentile who went beyond that boundary. I thought that was a, an amazing statement, knowing that how the Romans persecuted the Jews, knowing how Paul, before he became Paul, when he was Saul, how he persecuted people who followed Christ, and yet the Jews had the authority to execute Gentiles. We went, went beyond that boundary. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just me. That just seems odd. So it was considered that a Gentile was defiling, that's the next line, defiling the temple if they crossed that line. So if you remember Acts 21, let me, let me turn over here to Acts 21 and read 27 and 29. It says this, well, I'm going to start with 26. It says, then the next day, 
Paul took the men, having purified himself along with them, and entered the temple, announcing the completion of the purification days when the offering for each of them would be made. Verse 27, as the seven days were about to end, the Jews from Asia saw him in the temple complex, stirred up the whole crowd, and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people, our law, and this place. And what's more, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has profaned this holy place. Paul, <laughs> Paul just... Caused a riot, and they threw him in prison, which was not, uh, Paul was not, uh, I mean, he was accustomed to being in prison. <laughs> Come on, baby. He was accustomed to being in prison. So God redeems Gentiles and is going to continue to do that during the tribulation. A lot of people reject that idea. Um, so, that just suggests to us that the rapture church is not present during the tribulation. So I'm going to turn back to 3, chapter 3, verse 10. I want, to, I want you to read, hear this. He says in verse 10, he said, Because you have kept my command, talking to the letter, the letter to the church of Philadelphia, he said, Because you have kept my command to endure, in other words, to be patient, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come over the whole world to test those who live on the earth. So Paul was, he was falsely arrested. <laughs> I mean, he was just doing what he'd been called to do. So God's going to redeem those Gentiles. He's going to continue to do that through the tribulation. And, he, and he's going to reject unbelieving Gentiles just like he does today. You know, people say, why would God send people to hell? God doesn't send people to hell. People make their own choice. People make their own choice. And that's, I've had people leave church, not here that I know of, but I've had people leave church when you speak that truth. Um, everybody thinks everybody's going to go to heaven when they die. That's, that's not what the word says. <clears throat> but he's gonna, God's going to reject those unbelieving Gentiles who chose to run with Satan and the beast. And oppress his covenant people. So there, there's really a, a very distinct and sharp content, contrast in that vision between Jews and Gentiles. It tells us, again, that the raptured church will not be present during the tribulation. We believe. We're pre-tribulation believers. We believe that the church is going to be raptured and we're going to see the, the tribulation from in the clouds. That's what we believe. Last night at our pastor's meeting that we, we have once a month. One of the guys was dealing with a guy that believes in the patriotism gospel, whatever that is. And uh, he has uh, corrected this guy, this, this pastor, a number of times in church and in Bible studies. I said, man, have y'all Matthew 18 him? Yeah. And he's still there? I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's something the elders need to deal with uh, because he's creating confusion and chaos. And... Uh, you know, you just do it in love, but but he didn't believe. I don't know if he. I don't know what he believes. I don't know what the patriotism gospel is, but the, but you run into those kind of people, yes, ma'am. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay, hold that thought. Not tonight, but we'll get there. That's okay. That's okay. I I'm like you. But we'll get there. Um, so, so again, it's just a sharp contrast that we see there. But in, in, in the church, in Christ, there's not Greek and Jew, circumcision, uncircumcision, barbarian, Cynthia, and slave. But Christ is all in and all. I had this discussion yesterday with a guy about, you know, he said, well, I just don't like that guy. So, well, look, man, there's a lot of people I don't like. But my question is, do you love them? I mean, that's a question we all need to ask ourselves. There, there are people I don't like. I mean, sometimes we just have that opposing magnet to, to some people. You just, you know, they just grit your teeth every time they show up. But, but Christ said to love them. Love your neighbor. He said, love as I have loved you. 
He loved us there. And it's hard sometimes, but uh, if we're going to imitate Christ, we need to love others. No matter no matter what they believe, no matter what they say. You know, as I was walking the beach last last two weeks and, and, and sharing the gospel, I didn't just walk up and start sharing the gospel to them. You have to create a, a, a little bit of a relationship or a connection. But once once you just start talking to them and asking them about what they're doing, why they do it, and where they're from, and all this stuff, you know, it's just you, you, boom. They, they, they'll tell you stuff. Sometimes you just don't want to hear, but but you just listen and and Holy, let the Holy Spirit direct you. That's that that's what that's what we're to do. Colossians three eleven. Read that. So in the forty two months. 1260 days, three and a half years, that corresponds with this open and vile time, this evil life of the Antichrist, which dominates the last half of the tribulation. It is a bad time, a dark time on the earth. And that that period of time, I'm going to go over here to Luke 21. I want to read this to you. That'll be the culmination of the time of the Gentiles. In Luke 21, 24, it says, They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentile are fulfilled. So there are thousands of these Gentile nations that um, have occupied Jerusalem from over the his, times of history and they have oppressed the holy city of Jerusalem there's a little bit of that that goes on today because of the way Jerusalem is divided up between the Muslims and the Jordanians the Hashemite kingdom and, and the Jews it's, it's just to me it's just a I don't know it's just an odd thing but here's a, I'll give you a list of the, of the groups that have ruled Jerusalem you can look at them and, and go, up, go back and read some of this stuff about them you know, the, the big question today is, you know, everybody has this narrative that the Palestinians, well, there's no, there's no such thing as the Palestinians. Well, if you go back and read history, they're Arabs. That's who they are. They're Arabs. And, and, and so they're Arabs and they're Jews. No, I don't care if you're talking about Egypt or Saudi Arabia or Syria or Lebanon or Turkey or Iraq. Or, they're Arabs. They're Muslim, but they're, in most cases, but they're Arabs. But there's a lot of Christian Arabs as well. That's what Joel Rosenberg's ministry is over there. Um, is is the Joshua Fund is to to minister to the surrounding areas of Israel, uh, mostly Arabs, and, and 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 teach them about Christ. So today um, we know that Israel's self rule is fragile. <laughs> I, it's fragile. It's under attack. I, I just don't know if it's that fragile, if, if the uh, underlying tones, if they're just not, I just believe they're stronger than what we're hearing today. The thing that concerns me is the United States' relationship with Israel. That, that, that is a concern to me. But no matter how devastating or horrible the past rulers have been, the rule of the Antichrist, his demonic and human army, is going to be a lot more horrific. It's going to be terrible. Um, it says his rule will easily surpass any of the others that have oppressed Jerusalem. So we know that Iran calls Israel little Satan and the United States big Satan. And they have one goal, and that's to eradicate Israel and eradicate the United States of America. So when people ask why isn't the United States mentioned in the Bible, uh, maybe it's like we talked about earlier in Revelation, maybe it's because of the nuclear war or something, I don't know. Um, Maybe it's because of financial downfall. I, who knows? But it's going to be a bad time. And we'll see that as we move into these other judgments. Um, we should notice the clear connection between that the vision of these two witnesses, these two preachers, and these first two verses. Um, they are special called men, supernatural individuals who are going to proclaim Christ's message of judgment during those final stages of the of the uh, trampling of Jerusalem, when the Gentiles do that, talking about the armies to the north that we've talked about being Russia and, and whoever else, all these other Turkey and and uh, the other countries that we've talked about, um, these guys are going to preach the gospel so that the Jewish remnant can believe and enjoy God's protection. 
So there's seven things in the lives and ministry of these two guys that are that and that are uh, they're going to unfold in the next few verses. We'll we'll look at we're going to spend two more nights on chapter 12. And so here's a list of what 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 we see of these in these guys' lives: duty, attitude, identity, power, death, resurrection, impact. So I want to look at just tonight the duty and their attitude. So in verse three, here's what it says. When I find it, where is that three? Two. <laughs> okay. He says, I will. Okay. God says, I will empower my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days dressed in sackcloth. So the one who's speaking, we... we some of these scholars, they, they say they don't know who that is, but that can only be God as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's not identified, but it can only be God the Father. He's the only one that can empower them. He or, or Jesus. But the, the word witnesses is interesting in that it, the plural form is martis, and that our English word martyr comes from that. And there were a lot of witnesses of Christ during the early church, that they paid with their lives. All the disciples, John's the only one left. All the disciples gave their life. They were martyrs. And so, but that word is always used in the New Testament to refer to persons or people. And so the witnesses must be people, actual people. So there are two witnesses because the Bible requires the testimony of two people to confirm a fact or verify the truth. So their responsibility will be to prophesy. And as we've discussed, we know what that means. It means to speak forth or to proclaim or preach. These guys are going to be preachers. They're going to be preaching the truth. They're going to be offering salvation to those Gentiles and Jews. So we know that they're going to proclaim to the world that the disasters are going to occur in the last half of the tribulation, and those are the judgments of God. You know, I've told you before that uh, when the people on the earth during the tribulation finally figure out the people that have rejected God, when they finally figured out that he's the one that's, that's causing those judgments to occur, they're going to become even more resistant. They're going to be, they're, they're going to reject him even further. They're going to become more angry because he's the one that's doing it. Yet at the same time, Jesus is still trying to win them to him, to get them to turn to him. He's trying to save them. And so... These guys are going to warn that God's final outpouring of judgment and eternal hell will follow. I was listening to Billy Graham's sermon today, one of the classics that he that he does, and I just a little snippet. And he said, "We, you have a choice." He said, "You can either spend a million years or a billion years in heaven, or you can spend a million years or a billion years in hell." Like he just told it like it was. <laughs> So, at the same time, again, here he is. He's preaching the gospel, calling people to repentance and faith in Jesus. So that period of their ministry, 1,260 days, 42 months, last three years, three and a half years of the tribulation, this is the time when the forces of Antichrist, the enemies of Christ, will oppress the city of Jerusalem. And there will be a lot of Jews that will be sheltered in the wilderness. You can go to Revelation 12, 6 to read about that. So they are actual preachers. And the fact that they're actual preachers, there's not one, not just some symbol is indicated by their clothing and behavior. In other words, the sackcloth. Um, so their attitude. Let's talk about sackcloth. sackcloth. So it was just a rough, heavy, coarse cloth that was worn in ancient times as a symbol of mourning or symbol of distress, uh, grief, and humility. All I can think of when I read about what that stuff is like and just how bad I'd be itching wearing that junk. It's like John the Baptist and the junk he wore. But um, uh, we know that Jacob put on south sackcloth when he thought that Joseph had been killed. As we read in Genesis, David ordered the people to wear sackcloth after the matter of Abner. And King Hezekiah, he wore sackcloth when Jerusalem was attacked. In 2 Kings 19. That's one of my favorite stories there in 19. 
But these two guys put on the sackcloth as an object lesson to express their great sorrow, sorrow for the wretched and unbelieving world, which is wrecked by God's judgment. It's overrun by demon hordes. It's populated by wicked, sinful people who refuse to repent. Why do I need to repent? I'm, that, you know, I'm, I'm a good guy. You know, I'm, I'm a good person. I, I, I live a, a righteous life. L let me give you a definition of righteous. What the Bible says, our righteousness is just filthy rags. They don't know the word because they don't read the word. Uh, so they're also going to be mourning because of the, the desecration of the temple, the oppression of Jerusalem, and the rise of the Antichrist. So that's, that's the attitude. What about their identity? Verse 4. Here's what it says. It says, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So we've got olive trees and we've got lampstands. So the question of who these two witnesses are has puzzled and intrigued Bible scholars over the years, and, and they've suggested a lot of possibilities, and I've given you some of that tonight. But John simply identifies them as two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. What can that mean? What can they symbolize? They symbolize the light of revival. Since olive oil was commonly used in lamps. And guys, I've, I, I've told you, I, especially since coming back from this mission trip, the world is open to hearing about Christ. If we'll just take a step of faith and create a connection, create a little bit of a relationship with people and just listen. They'll pour out their guts to you. A revival. So the connecting of the lamps to the trees is intended to, to give us this depiction of this constant, spontaneous, continuous supply of flowing oil from the holy trees into the lamps. Never ending. It symbolizes the truth the truth that God will bring salvation, not bring salvation from human power, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. When, when, when I get calls, um, it's like our niece today called and you, you just got to pray. You just got to pray. Just like Wes, you just got to pray. There's power in that word and, 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 and praying. And, and uh, uh, if nothing else, when, when, you, when you fearlessly are led to someone, the, the very least we can do is just pray for them. They'll always let you pray. Walking up down that beach, there are people you talk to, and, and there was no Holy Spirit nudge to, to share Christ, but what can I pray for you? Is there a miracle in your life that, if Jesus was to grant you a miracle in your life today, what would that miracle be? They'll tell you something. It may be the most secular thing that, that they, you can imagine. I'd like to win the lottery. Just pray for them. You don't even talk about the light. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, you know, I told y'all that I, I believe that all of us at some point need a reset in our spirit. And, 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 and that's what mission trips do for me. I mean, I get a reset just about every week from some, some of y'all that I talk to or something. But, but that's a big reset. And, and we, we serve this, this miracle producing God. And, and we don't know when he's going to do those miracles, but we know he is fully capable. And we need to pray for those miracles. Um, just ask him. He's just waiting to hear from us. He is a, yeah. I mean, so thinking about those people up on the Bering Sea that live in a 12 by 24 house, 8, 10, 12 people. 
and I get to come home to our house and my bed and my shower and go get some fresh running water out of the faucet. They, this woman's daughter, I told you, she didn't even have any electricity since last September when the tsunami came through, wiped out her house. And so these guys with this ministry, they went up and were able to hook her house up with electricity. Eight, eight or ten people live in that little 12 by 24 bed. It's a miracle that we get to live like we live. That's why I see it. You know? Okay. So, the, these witnesses are going to lead this spiritual revival that's going to come, culminate in the building of the temple. It'll be done by God. It won't be done by man. It'll only be done by God. Uh, their preaching will be instrumental in Israel's national conversion, and the temple associated with the conversion will be the millennial people, the people during the millennial. So, it's impossible to be dogmatic, and I wrote in there, arrogant opinion. There's a lot of people you run into that are just dogmatic about a lot of things. Some about scripture, about the word, about what they, how they interpret something. But, but these guys, the specific identity of these two guys, there's a number of reasons that, that we that suggest that they might be Moses and Elijah. Why? Because of the miracles they performed are similar to the judgments of the Old Testament. And those miracles simulated repentance. So both the Old Testament and the Jewish tradition expected Moses and Elijah to return in the future. Malachi 4, 5, it predicted the return of Elijah and the Jews believed that God's promise to raise up a prophet like Moses. It necessitated his return. So both these two guys appeared with Christ at the transfiguration. So that's the reason I believe it was probably Moses and Elijah. Don't know that. But that's just what I believe. And that is a preview of the second coming of Christ. So we know that both those guys left the earth in unusual ways. Elijah never died. How does that work? That's just a God thing. He was transported to heaven in his fiery chariot. And God supernaturally buried Moses' body in a secret location. So we're going to stop right there, and, and we'll jump into it next week. But, but we don't know the identity of these two guys. It's not revealed. And, and uh, it's all speculation about who they are. 